Uh, we're still a committed mixed farmer um, to the degree that we're about 50-50 land use between pastures or livestock and the cropping component. With regards to the seed stock operations, which is our main part of the deal, and that's probably where I spend 90% of my time, certainly 90% of my thinking time. We get contractors in to do the cropping part because they're specialists in that and we specialise in the sheep breeding part of the deal. Genomics has begun from a breeding philosophy or just on its very early days of just being research material to now being fundamental to our breeding program. It's about 20% of all young sheep on the place will get genomic tested. Look, it's like all objective things. We use it as a tool and it's another guide that we can use but obviously we still use our eyes in the breeding program but it's been a wonderful tool to build on to increase the accuracies of the breeding values to get some information about those hard to measure traits like meter and inequality. So I did a Nuffield scholarship eight years ago and that's probably really what's sent me in the direction of really trying to breed a dual purpose maternal type of a sheep with serious attributes with regards to um, growth and maternal and, and meat attributes. So four years ago, I guess I was started on a journey to, to really put those traits into our breeding objectives. I guess now we're seeing the result of that breeding program actually express itself. So there's been a marked change in the, in the type of sheep that we're breeding. So it was just fortunate at that time that some, some pretty handy research was coming through with regards to building those maternal traits of more fat, more muscle and more growth into that ewe. So it's really just breeding that ewe a bigger fuel tank, a bigger capacity, a bigger reserve so that she can grow that wool and raise those lambs well. We introduced six month shearing because there was a lot of scientific evidence to say that there's a lot of maternal attributes associated with plain bodiness, getting rid of wrinkle and horn. And there is a correlation between that wrinkle and wool cut. And it's just creating surface area for it to cut wool off. So if we wanted to make this maternal merino viable and not lose wool cut, then we decided staple length would be the option as opposed to staple thickness. And then we found we're getting to staple lengths of 120 and 130 mils, which was uh, being penalised in the marketplace. It was really caught, nearly being treated as if it was overgrown. And there was a bit of a discount there. I think as a financial deal, you wouldn't necessarily do it. We found overall we cut about 8 to 10% more wool. That's just simply based on that off-shear shearing kick. Uh, we find that that pretty much is cancelled out by the cost of the extra shearing. We do save on a crutching, so other than cash flow implications in the sense that we get six months of our wool sold and offsetting interest or working for us as opposed to walking around the paddock. Um, the actual benefit of the extra wool cut and the saving on the crutching is sort of cancelled out by the cost of the shearing. So why would you do it? It's once again this maternal behaviour. We really found that off shears kick. Now we've got the great opportunity that we can join and lamb about six weeks off shears and that is when sheep are just absolutely doing their best. It's, it's one of the greatest management things between that and wedge tail wheat, those two, introduction of those two management things have probably transformed what we do more than anything. The introduction of dual purpose wheats, just amazing to be able to put that into your system in the middle of the winter when you've got a feed gap. We're still an autumn lambing, so we have got really, really peak demand in that winter period. And to be able to put your ewes and lambs, give your pastures a spell, do some spraying or any renovating that you need to do on those pastures during that period, and have them really set up for the spring when you have to get off your wedge tail weeds, it's just been huge. So, uh, well, look, we can, we can really have increased our DSEs um, that we can run on the same number of um, hectares simply because we've got that dual purpose weed option and we've really improved the capital outlay in our shearing shed situation. Um, we can really have good wool preparation. We've got a top uh, best you can money could buy, a raised board shearing setup. We were talking about a watering system just because of carting water in the droughts because I, I can't destock because I've got seed stock studs I just can't replace. We've put that in place so we've got troughs through the farm and things so if we do have to cart water we just have to cart it to one centralised place. All I've built a significantly bigger dam that's going to hopefully drought proof the place. So my capital spend has still been a lot about that labour issue. So we've done a lot of fencing, we've got a lot of laneway systems, so we've done a lot of things that make us a lot more efficient. I often get asked the question, what is the value? And I did an economics degree, so I'm always interested about the benefit cost of things and what it actually is the gain. And one problem that I've identified is in the last four to eight years, I've changed so many things at once I've changed, I've done lifetime ewe, I'm a much better manager. We merely manage condition score. I've changed the whole genetic makeup of these animals. 
We've taken on six months shearing, we've introduced wedge tar, we've got better pastures established, so we've got better feed components. So there's so many levers have been changed at that time to actually break down and find you know, the economic breakdown. And where's the benefit? How much of the benefit that we're seeing in lambic percentages are actually by the genetic merit and it's not by my management? The industry that I live in, they are not early adapters. So one of the big challenges that I've got, I've, I've, I've have developed something which is an alternative people can make a choice. There's a, there's a stark different approach than what's traditionally been the case, particularly in the Marinos. So there's a huge challenge and it'll keep me, could keep me occupied for 10 lifetimes, I think. I've got a great concern when you look at the numbers in the Australian sheep industry, while it seems like our ewe flock has sort of maintained her numbers in the last five, 10 years, um, it's very slight rebuilds, but no great, nothing dramatic happened. The actual change of the dynamics of that flock um, the Merino is just losing market share like you wouldn't believe to the maternal composites and different options and things. There's a lot of different marketers with good products um, telling them that they've got a real option there and it frustrates me um, that particularly a lot of fine wool Merino growers are just saying enough's enough and, and I'm going to make this huge U-turn after four or five generations when they're just not aware that there isn't an, an alternative which is to redesign their Merino and try to make her into that better dual purpose maternal type of animal.